You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy Special Wednesday Evening Edition, brought to you by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Today is February 4, 2009, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy, broadcasting to you from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Coming up next, Dr. Linda Cox will tell us what's new with immunotherapy. A little later, we will meet the president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, Dr. Richard Gower. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Linda Cox. Dr. Cox is an assistant professor, cl clinical professor of medicine at Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medicine in Davie, Florida. Uh, I've known Linda for quite a long time. She's, she's probably one of the most energetic people I know. If you uh, if something needs to get done, she probably has already done it. And that's, that's, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, Linda Cox uh, sends more emails than anybody else, and that's, that includes Mary Lou Callahan, uh, although uh, Mary Lou hasn't been sending as much lately uh, due to health reasons. Um, Linda Cox is an expert on immunotherapy, and she's become the de facto uh, expert on uh, sublingual immunotherapy. And so we're going to talk with Dr. Cox uh, about, about her, special, her expertise in immunotherapy, but also if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your experiences and, and how you got interested in this topic to begin with. I, I think that would just be absolutely fascinating. Well, Thank you cool. for the instructions uh, earlier today. I didn't think I'd be able to, to pull this off. Um, well, originally I thought I was getting an update about sublingual, but then when I... Um, I looked at the um, blast email. It said an update on immunotherapy. So I thought what I would cover today. Oops, I'm not moving. Why is that? You have to have your arrow over the window, and then it'll move. You can use the little oh, okay. wheel or the. So the top. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the topics I thought I would cover um, uh, included under subcutaneous immunotherapy the new allergen extract preparation guidelines. Um, the Immunotherapy Safety Surveillance Survey, some preliminary data, and then uh, in terms of sublingual immunotherapy, kind of a complete update of what's been going on in the United States and a little update about what's been going on uh, abroad. But Jay just asked me uh, to explain how I got involved and interested in immunotherapy. And he was there in the beginning because I was working with the immunotherapy committee and at that time we were directed to develop some forms for uh, immunotherapy prescriptions and administration as well as skin testing. And Jay was the joint task force liaison for the immunotherapy practice parameters. So Jay and I for a couple months there went back and forth kind of working on these immunotherapy forms. And yeah, that was that sort was of my initial... That was what the first practice parameter on immunotherapy was, not it? Right, and that's really how, I mean, I was just a member of the immunotherapy committee at that time, but that sort of got me involved, and then I started talking about standardizing immunotherapy, went on to become a committee chair, and later, um, because of the interest in sublingual immunotherapy, was directed by the organizations to develop some information, uh, and we ended up doing a, a comprehensive review. And it sort of, it was one thing after another, but it began, I think, with the same standardization uh, of the immunotherapy forms that were used in the uh, immunotherapy practice guidelines. Now, you actually designed those forms, didn't you? With you, Jay. You were okay. part of that. <laughs> you don't remember, but you and I went back and forth. I go, well, what about having a column on this? <laughs> and you go, oh, no, they don't want that, or they do. Or, and I think maybe in retrospect, it was just you and I. You weren't really sending it back to the whole task force. But I'll, I'll tell but you, I'll, just, just an anecdote, uh, the two of us also worked on an instant reference for cluster and rush immunotherapy. Right. And uh, I sent you like a brief outline, and it came back within minutes, filled out, and then I <laughs> made some modifications and sent it back to you. And I think within two hours, we had the whole thing done. It, it, was, it, just, it just blew my mind. Where is that, by the way, that uh, reference? Is it be, going to be disseminated? At yeah, it'll the, be disseminated, uh, and in fact, there will be a whole series of... Uh, instant references that the college is going to produce. It will also be on the, the website for the Joint Task Force, uh, but, but this is going to be a whole series uh, okay. uh, through the college, so that will that, be really great. Okay, um, the first thing I wanted to go over, and, and, and I'm going over this just uh, not for you necessarily 
to read this, but I know you're going to post this on the website. But uh, try to bring allergist attention to uh, these new events. And this actually came out about an hour or two ago uh, to all of us who are members of the Joint Council and who aren't, because this was sent to all allergists. And it, it is a um, email about the allergen immunotherapy extract preparation test. In the new practice parameters, there is an extract preparation guidelines. And it is sort of the SOP, or the standard operating procedure, uh, for what your extract preparer should go through. And it's basically focusing on aseptic technique. And in the guidelines, it says that your, your preparer will pass a written test. And then every year, they will uh, pass a what's called a media fill test. And that's basically a test that assesses sterile or aseptic technique. And you can do this by purchasing a kit online. And they give you an example of a, a company that they've contracted with who will provide discounted rate for these media fill tests. There's also a handbook that was uh, prepared. Uh, Mike Nelson from Walter Reed led this uh, initiative. Um, and it's, it's a handbook that, again, you can use as a manual in your office. But uh, you can also have your staff use it to study for this online test. And they essentially can't, pa uh, can't fail the online test because you can't go to the next question uh, until you get the, uh, the one question correct. Those are um, it's nice free for members. <laughs> but there is a fee that. for non-members. <laughs> Um, this is the allergen extract preparation guidelines. It's in the practice parameters, but we just recently issued an erratum in Jackie. And the only, only changes in this erratum is that it was an additional language about who these uh, extract preparing personnel should, should be. And basically, it's a broad spectrum. But most importantly, that they're appropriately trained health, health professionals. And that could include nurses, medical assistants, physician assistants. Um, and then it notes that the physician is responsible for providing general oversight and supervision of the compounding. So that's the only, only change. But the original extract preparation guidelines is in the immunotherapy practice parameters that were published in Jackie in 2007. So I just wanted to make people aware of it because your staff is uh, going to need to um, or should be taking this written test. And we do, again, have a handbook for them to uh, study. And again, you may want to print it up and have it available in your office as uh, your SOP. Hey, Linda, why, why did they come up with this? I mean, were there some concerns that extract uh, was being prepared correctly, or what happened? Right. Um, this was in response to USP 797. USP stands for United States Pharmacopeia. And it's an organization that oversees uh, pharmacies, compounding pharmacies, hospital pharmacies. Technically, uh, freestanding offices uh, are not really under the uh, dictum of the uh, USB uh, pharmacopoeia, but um, it's strongly recommended that we follow these guidelines. In the future, we may find that we're going to be faced with rules about laminar hoods and, and short dating on expiration dilution. So this was done really as a proactive measure. And Don Arison and Rebecca Burke, who's the uh, attorney for joint counsel, really took the lead on this. They hired a USB consultant, and they were the ones who developed uh, those written guidelines, which were subsequently uh, reviewed by both the college, academy, and joint counsel and approved. So this is, in, in, in essence, voluntary, but it's strongly recommended voluntary. Strongly, strongly recommended. Yeah, I assume it's either this or some uh, dr draconian law that would help. Yes, that's, yes. And, and, and um, there are slight differences in what the USB chapter on extract preparation actually says. These guidelines were developed and approved before the guidelines in the USB chapter were finalized. And I've uh, had some discussion with Don Aronson and Rebecca Burke about the, the mild differences. And Rebecca, who is the attorney, feels that if we follow uh, these guidelines that were uh, prepared, that uh, people should be fine, and that it's acceptable to follow these written guidelines. The difference has to do with a gown and a, and a hood, I mean a gown and uh, a mask. If, if your facility strictly follows uh, the USB guidelines, you may have to have a gown and um, a mask when you prepare allergen extract. But in the written guidelines that were prepared by joint counsel, this is not a requirement. 
Any other questions? No, that's fantastic. Thanks for uh, for developing that. It really saved us. Hopefully, <laughs> I think so. Um, the other thing I wanted to make people aware, and everybody should have uh, received this, who's a member of the college or the academy, this is a three-year immunotherapy safety surveillance survey, and it's being funded by both the college and academy. And uh, David Bernstein from University of Cincinnati and um, Gary Liss are sort of uh, leading this effort. And a survey went out to everyone about four or five months ago, and it's asking about uh, systemic reactions in the office, near fatal and fatal reactions. And it's also, and this is kind of unique, because this is the first time we've done that with this type of survey, but um, it's, it's asking you to uh, give, you, give the number of grade one, grade two, grade three uh, systemic reactions. So we're actually looking uh, to see the actual number of systemic reactions and giving, um, looking at the different levels of severity. Um, early in this stage of development, David Bernstein and I thought, well, it would be nice if we had a universal grading system that was used by everybody because there are several different systems for describing immunotherapy systemic reactions. A grade two isn't a grade two the same for everyone. So we approached the World Allergy Association and the uh, European Allergy Association Immunotherapy Committee chairs and asked them if they would be interested in developing a universal grading system for immunotherapy systemic reactions. And uh, for the past five or six months, uh, this project has been under development. Uh, Desiree Lorenas, who's uh, involved in both the college and academy immunotherapy committee, has been sort of spearheading this effort. At a meeting of immunotherapy experts in Paris a couple weeks ago that Rich Gower and I both attended representing the college, uh, I think the grading system was finalized, and that's what you're looking at right now. Uh, it is based on, to some extent, single organ uh, for grade one, two or more organ systems for grade two, unless it's asthma or uh, uterine abdominal cramps, and then it goes on to three, four, and five, with five being death. Um, four and five are fairly universal grading systems, according to uh, the NIH representative, Alcas Toikas, who attended this meeting, uh, collapse being four and, and five being death. So we're hoping this will evolve into a universal grading system. So when we say grade two, we all sort of know what a grade two systemic reaction. At this point in time, Dick Rocky, myself, Desiree, and David uh, Bernstein are going to work on developing a paper to uh, describe this system and, and the process that led to it. I, I assume that but this, this is so t this is still a little that. tentative, but it's it's in a final stage of being tentative. It's going to come with a uh, new form that will have this grading system on it that we can use. I think so because that's my. This is the rest of the questionnaire that came out, but this is a, a something David Bernstein developed. It's a tracking sheet for immunotherapy systemic reactions, and we would put it as a, a legend. Um, David thought that uh, when you send out these surveys, you're asking somebody to give a, a 12 months worth of systemic reactions, and you can remember your severe ones, but um, the grade ones and twos might become a distant memory. So he developed an Excel spreadsheet that people can keep in their injection room or wherever they administer the injections, and they can keep a record. So when they do get the surveys, they can sit down and just easily um, generate the data and, and submit it. The other nice thing about this survey, and this is information I think we're interested in getting, is whether epinephrine was administered um, and how quickly it was administered. I know Dick Lockie is very interested in looking at this information, because there is theory that delay in administration of epinephrine um, may contribute to more serious or, or fatal outcomes. So David said that this uh, Excel spreadsheet was sent out. I have not seen it myself, but it, it didn't go with the original survey, but it, uh, it was subsequently developed. And I think that's all I have. Oh, no. Um, David uh, presented uh, the initial data at the college meeting and subsequently collated into an abstract, uh, which made late-breaking abstract for the academy. And um, after collecting four months of data, they had uh, uh, 497 respondents that represented uh, a little over 1,500 uh, prescribers and 4.7 million injections, with a median of 4,650 injections per prescriber a year. And there were 
at that time two indirectly reported fatal uh, reactions that were confirmed, which is a rate of about one in two point something million, which is similar to what we've seen dating back to 1945. Uh, David emailed me earlier today and told me the number may be up to six. So this is um, these numbers are very preliminary. But as you can see from the slide, uh, we're seeing about 18 percent of reported grade three reactions. Uh, 52 percent had grade two reactions. Uh, and um, 74 percent had grade one. That should be a grade one. That's a typo. Um, what they observed was a higher percentage of practices uh, that had uh, grade three reactions uh, had a higher number of uh, um, immunotherapy injections per practice. So they're suggesting that the more high volume practices may be the ones that are um, seeing the more severe reactions. Uh, not, not, qu not quite clear what to do with that information. It might be just that they're seeing a higher number of patients and the statistics start um, going in favor of having more reactions when you get more injections. Uh, there is going to be what's called a long survey sent out uh, to the uh, practices that had the severe reactions, and they're going to be further analyzed for things like beta blockers, uh, comorbid conditions. And I'm sure we'll see another paper in several presentations coming out of that. Is and again, this is a three-year study funded by both the college and the academy. It would probably be better to look at it as reaction rates for the practice, you know, divided by the number of injections. Mm -hmm. And also, um, is there any desire to determine um, what the dose of the extract was and how high? That'll be part. That's what's called the long survey, which is um, which has been part of. Uh, this is a modification of the original survey that Dick Lockie used for the 19. 45 to 1987 data, and it was used in the second and third surveys. It's been updated um, to be appropriate for the uh, time period, but it's the same sort of information that's gathered. So doses looked at, uh, number of allergens, uh, timing of when they received treatment, if they received treatment, if they had asthma, if they had uh, pulmonary function tests sometime before uh, the treatment, what was their FEV1. So a lot of the recent uh, things that have been identified, like uh, symptomatic asthma as a risk factor for uh, the fatal reactions, were identified in David's last survey from the long, uh, the long survey. So we're going to get the final uh, word pretty quickly then, aren't we? Yeah, I'm surprised he was able to get this much data with what now it's about six months of survey information. And um, 497 respondents is a pretty good turnout. Um, that Phenomenal. represents 1,500 prescribers. That's that's high. I think that's one of the highest um, turnouts they've had for this kind of survey. And I think that's all I had to say about subcutaneous immunotherapy um, is is what we're doing through our committee work. And uh, in, in both projects, the extract preparation quiz, the extract preparation handbook, they're all joint committee projects, the college and the academy. And Don Aronson sort of got those projects started. Well, that, that's really great. Thanks for that. That'll really help. Now, I'm just going to move over to sublingual immunotherapy, just to refresh everybody's memory. We currently still do not have a product that is uh, has in the package insert that is approved for uh, sublingual use. Um, it, the products we have currently have a big black box warning about a physician needing to be present at the time that it is administered. Um, we currently do not have a CPT code for the reason that we don't have a, an approved formulation. And Medicare is quite uh, clear that it will not cover sublingual immunotherapy. And most third party payers will not pay if uh, Medicare does not pay. Um, we need an approved product. I just recently learned from uh, Don Aronson that in the past year, uh, a Blue Cross Blue Shield somewhere in New England uh, submitted a request for a CPT code for SLIT, which was not supported by any of the specialty societies. And to get a new code, you have to have support from at least one of those specialty societies. Uh, so apparently, according to the CBT rules, it's now in I guess embargoed for a year. You can't reapply for another year after you fail to get the uh, the code approved or even considered. Some of the carriers have uh, covered slit throughout the country, but they're using an unspecified services code. 
uh, which is uh, ends with 95199. And this is an old excerpt from a Blue Cross Blue Shield report for somewhere in Kansas where they were uh, um, they they did agree to cover it. Um, in, after negotiating with a, a certain physician group, according to the medical director that I spoke with at that time. But it's not by any means universally covered. It's, it's sort of covered by exception. Now, 95165, uh, that, that's just the subcutaneous code, right? Right, and that's all you really officially can use uh, the um, extract code for. So Don Zellerson's theory... People, that's, that's, so, that's wrong, isn't it? Right. His theory was, why, why would Blue Cross Blue Shield in New England apply for a code? He, he thought that it might be because they wanted to get it uh, 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 an experimental code so they could then, in turn, deny payment for using the 95165 code for sublingual immunotherapy, which some people do do, which technically is not correct. Couldn't they just deny it? Yeah, that's what I thought, but that... that that was his theory. I'm not sure why an, uh, an insurance company would seek to. Uh, 95165 is only for injection. Is, is it fraud to, to build? For Medicare, it would be fraud. Yeah. Um, but, well, what about, I mean, what's fraud for Medicare yeah. would be fraud for Blue Cross Blue Shield, wouldn't it? It would be, and I know that there are allergists in uh, parts of the country of, who have seen people bill 95165 for a slit and have actually approached the companies uh, seeking, telling them of this, and they really apparently haven't taken action. I'm not sure if the, uh, the other third-party payers uh, are as concerned, but I'm getting everything second, third, fourth hand. So, I mean, would it be the second, uh, you know, the insurers who would be, who would like um, make a claim for fraud there? I mean, they could. They could. If I mean, they follow, I mean, and they almost all do. Yeah. They follow the Medicare guidelines. So, um, if Medicare says nine five one six five is a code that's only for um, sub, I mean, subcutaneous immunotherapy, then uh, most insurers would probably follow that lead. In this particular example I give with the Blue Shield report, they actually have a little excerpt saying, we know that our parent organization um, has said it's experimental and it's not covering it, but we're, we're not following that. Um, so I guess on a case-by-case -case they can make exceptions. But in this case, the code that's used, uh, that they allowed sublingual to be billed under, is uh, miscellaneous services code. 95199. It, so it, it basically kicks it out to a paper claim, not a automatic. So they're not really allowing people to bill 95165. They're telling them to use miscellaneous code, which is probably what will happen if we get an approved product uh, before we get a code, which is probably the most likely scenario, because it's about a two-year timeline. Um, from when you actually submit for a code, because it has to go through all these different committees, the CPT committee, and then it has to go over to the RUC committee, which um, prices the code, and then eventually it's approved. So right now, as far as I know, we're in some sort of embargo, so it, it would probably be the end of this year before another code even could be applied for. Um, as I often say in my lectures, some of the hurdles we have to overcome as a specialty is our negative perception, which I think we're beginning to overcome. But um, at the same time, we're, we're seeing this treatment um, being used by other groups. And now it's actually in my supermarket. There's a huge uh, shelf where there's all the sublingual uh, treatment for all kinds of things like uh, warts and uh, asthma. <laughs> Gosh, and, it makes uh, me wonder what supermarket you go to. <laughs> It's the upscale public <laughs> green wise supermarket, but there's a, a lot of perception. Every I think we all recognize uh, in our patients they want natural sublingual is perceived as being more natural, uh, but we're going to fight a little bit of a battle of trying to show that there's a difference between what is evidence based and what is um, popularity based or uh, some of the other uses of sublingual. Um, this is a study that was recently published, but it was presented at not this last year's, uh, but the year before a college meeting. And it was a survey 
of college members about their perception about sublingual and basically assessed how many people were actually prescribing sublingual in early 2007. And about 6% of the population was using or prescribing SLIT. Uh, most were using U.S. extracts. Um, and um, majority had patients pay out of pocket, but about 26% were billing insurance. Uh, 94 did not prescribe SLIT. And if I recall correctly, I haven't seen this in, in writing, but Joint Council did a similar survey. I don't know if anybody on the call remembers, but it was similar statistics in terms of people prescribing and not prescribing. Does anybody remember? It came out in, um, I think it came out in the minutes of the Joint Council meeting. And, maybe the college bulletin. Of why people aren't prescribing SLIT? No, no. How many people, and this is about a year later, were prescribing and not prescribing SLIT? Yeah, the, yeah. College, uh, the Joint Council did a more recent survey. And the numbers, if I remember correctly, were about the same percentage-wise that were yeah, and were not prescribing SLIT. It's a pretty it was still a small percentage, yeah. yeah. Uh, however, if there was an improved product, as you can see, uh, about 65% would use it to treat rhinitis, 40% would treat moderate to severe asthmatics. Of note, this group has not been studied in terms of uh, safety. Uh, and then 45% uh, would treat children under age 5. And then about 13% would not use SLIT at all, even if it was approved. But about 30% of this population didn't use SKIT, uh, subcutaneous <laughs> immunotherapy. Uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, any questions about that? That's now since been published in Annals. Uh, in terms of the status of the US trials, uh, there are basically now four companies, one, two, three, four companies that are conducting uh, clinical trials in the United States. Only two are doing solution studies, and that's Greer and Planet Technology. And uh, two companies are doing tablet studies, and that's Stellargens and uh, Shearing Plow. ALK did the original studies. Uh, what we always have to keep in mind is that our, our patient population is essentially polysensitized. And this is a survey of over 10,000 US uh, um, citizens that were skin tested to a battery of allergens, and the mean number of positive skin tests defined as being a wheel of greater than 3 millimeters was 3.5. And this is for general population. Uh, a recent study that looked at allergen sensitivities in asthmatics and then correlated it with other things like exhaled uh, nitric oxide and PC20, um, looking again at a battery of skin tests, found that 95% of the now what you might consider the atopic population had at least one positive quick skin test, and 81% had positive reactions to three or more allergens. So for the most part, our population uh, that we would be looking at treating are going to be polysensitized patients. And that's going to be important when we start thinking about um, uh, sublingual immunotherapy and whether we can treat to these multiple allergens, because almost all these studies are single allergens. I'm going to go over this quickly because this has been pre presented a number of times, but Greer has done um, safety and dosing phase one studies on four allergens, uh, grass, uh, ragweed, house dust mite, and cat. They underwent a seven-step rush protocol to maximum tolerated dose, and then they were followed for uh, eight weeks. And uh, this is uh, the protocol. Um, uh, and then uh, they started with a total of 128 screened subjects. Uh, they had 91 who completed the dose escalation and then 78 who completed the eight weeks of treatment. Um, this is an example of the dose escalation. This is the uh, uh, Timothy grass because it's 100,000 BAUs. And the um, seventh dose was 14,000 uh, BAUs. Uh, ragweed, uh, the seventh dose corresponded to 60 micrograms of AMBA-1. This is a, a table that shows you what their maximum uh, tolerated uh, uh, single dose and then the cumulative dose for the day. So with Timothy Grass, the uh, maximum or cumulative dose was uh, 14,000. Um, Ragweed was 90,000. Uh, dust mining cats was lower, but their target dose was lower because they were starting with a 10,000 BAU or AU uh, concentration. And uh, so the uh, 
range of minimum to maximum dose, as you can see here, for AG, we went from 7,000 to 784,000 uh, um, over the um, eight-week period. In terms of reasons for withdrawal, uh, four withdrew for uh, moderate to severe symptoms at the lowest dose. Five withdrew due to adverse reactions related to uh, SLIT um, and two uh, not related to SLIT and two possibly related to SLIT. This is sort of a table Bob Ash put together. To, uh, these are the grade of symptom severity with three being the most severe and two is a moderate reaction, which he defines as definite awareness of signs and symptoms bothersome but tolerable. And as you can see, almost all the reactions fell either in, in two uh, and the majority actually in a grade one, but none in grade three. What, what was observed is there was no identified risk factors uh, in terms of predicting who would have adverse reactions. And that included skin test reactivity, having a diagnosis of asthma, their age, I mean their age or sex. None of these were identified as potential risk factors for adverse reactions. And that really has seems to be panning out in the collective SLIT literature. There doesn't seem to be clear identified risk factors for who's going to have um, adverse reactions or, more importantly, uh, the more severe adverse reactions, the grade three or four uh, systemic reactions. Um, this is the table they have in their paper. They were required to list any side effects. So if they woke up with nasal symptoms, that got recorded in the diary, and that was listed as an adverse reaction. So they actually had over 24,000 adverse reactions in the study of the 100 and some patients. A little hard to decipher the importance of that. Um, so in summary, uh, this phase one study of four different allergens, the maximum tolerated doses range from 50 to to about 2,000 for cat and dust mite, 30 to 90 um, AMBA-1 units, which is micrograms, uh, because FDA units equal micrograms with ragweed, and then 50 to about 21,000 BAUs for Timothy grass. Uh, they went on to do what they now call a 2B study. They were, it, it's a ragweed study. They looked at two doses, 4.8 versus 48. And again, one FDA unit is equal to one microgram of AMBA-1. Uh, they looked at symptom scores, medication scores, and safety, and some immunologic changes. Uh, primary outcome was symptom score reduction. Um, and what they saw was a dose response in terms of symptom score reduction, uh, with the higher dose having a 0.81 change. But it didn't quite make statistical significance. The p-value was 0.051. There was a significant change in both groups in terms of medication, uh, and it met statistical significance in the higher dose group. They also both showed some immunologic uh, changes in terms of specific IgA and IgG. Um, and um, there was a greater frequency of primarily oral mucosal adverse reactions, uh, which is considered a local reaction with SLIT in the group that received the SLIT versus the placebo group. Uh, they did decide uh, to go on to a full phase three, which uh, they just completed this year. They are currently unblinding and analyzing the data, so they don't know, but they are hoping to have results available by March 1st. Um, I just spoke with uh, one of the real representatives, and they were hoping to have something to present um, after March 1st. Um, and if they do and you're interested, I could come back on, and present it on, the, um, it, on, on this uh, conference call. I have a feeling um, that if it does show something significant, we'll probably hear about it on the Today Show and the evening news. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. If it's negative, you probably won't want to hear about it. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, another yeah. failed study. But it's, if it's positive, the bells and whistles be going out. Uh, I think they're, they're optimistic. They're, you know, if it's successful, they're hoping to submit. and. Uh, have some sort of response by the end of the year, but uh, we'll see. They also, I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly, because they did a phase 2B similar for grass uh, at the same time, but earlier season. Uh, sim they're basically identical protocols. They were treated about 8 to 10 weeks before season. Uh, criteria was based on skin test reactivity, which is different from Europe. They, Europe usually includes a specific IgE serum test as well, so they have to have blood and skin test positivity 
uh, to get included in the European immunotherapy trials. And uh, what happened, and this is just their press release because I couldn't get anything anywhere about the results except for some email dialogue. And basically what happened was there was no difference in the placebo versus treated group in terms of having symptoms during the grass season. In other words, there was no increase in season, so for that reason they couldn't really see an effective treatment. Was it just a weak grass season? I'm not sure. That's what some people have blamed. But I, I had, um, in one of the meetings I attended in Europe uh, last year, a, a small slip meeting, Hal Nelson was discussing his clinical trial. He's currently conducting a, a grass uh, pollen slit study that's looking at Timothy alone versus Timothy plus nine other allergens. Completely unique study. We won't get the results until the academy meeting because he's been very mum and he, he wants his fellow to present. But he showed us the grass counts from the year that his study took place, which was um, this previous year, uh, versus the year before, which these studies took place. And they looked like they had a robust season. Um, and the season that his trial took place, uh, the counts were not that good. So uh, it, it, I, I don't know. The answer is it's not known. I know ALK ran into exactly the same problem. ALK did a grass tablet study. They've had uh, a number of large studies in Europe in, in adults and children have shown some very nice responses. I'm talking about studies with over 800 patients. In fact, they recently, and I think it's in this issue of Jackie, published their pediatric uh, trial that showed very nice response in terms of symptom reduction, somewhere in the 63% reduction in symptom scores in the first treatment season. However, in the U.S., same thing as the Greer study. They could not see a difference uh, in terms of the placebo and the treatment group in terms of uh, increase in symptoms during season. Uh, so anyway, speculation was the counts weren't, weren't that um, good. Some have speculated maybe it was patient selection. These were not severe grass allergic patients. But nobody's officially released any results. Uh, if you look at the percentage of multi-sensitization, is that different mm -hmm. between, uh, I mean, is that clearly different? Not in the European studies. They have a fair number that have other sensitizations, probably approaching 50%, and they did not see a difference in terms of them responding to the grass tablet uh, in their clinical trials. What about the, U what about the U.S. Uh, data? In other words, uh, uh, they never analyzed this. This is the most I could I could officially um, officially get out of, uh, of this clinical trial. I did hear uh, from a reasonable source that uh, they may have walked into the, into the grass season with fairly high symptom scores. Uh, in other words, they already were symptomatic going into grass season. Right. But nothing's been officially presented. The company didn't want to, um, to an I, I present the data. Right. So, I, I'm not a, I'm, I was, uh, I guess, a consultant for the shearing, uh, but not anymore. But ALK, I wasn't involved in any of this. So I, I do have more information, but I was never given permission to uh, release it. But those are some of the things that sound at plausible patient selection. Maybe the patients uh, were symptomatic from other allergens going into it. So uh, they already had fairly high symptom scores and didn't have that much room to go up from being polysensitized. Right, right. So I, I think patient selection is a big issue. With the Greer study, when I was at um, a meeting in Genoa with the Academy and uh, WOW, there was a small meeting that you weren't there, were you, Lanny? No. no. It was Tom and uh, uh, Dick. Uh, one of the thoughts was the Greer study might have been underpowered. They just didn't have enough uh, uh, um, patients enrolled in the, in the uh, phase to be um, this study. Right. They started out with 115, and they had three groups. That was one thought. Yeah, no, no. I, I, well, those are thoughts if you don't get the same results. Uh, so you have to sort of s search for well, all Well, this is solution studies. And if you look at the European literature, in my opinion, um, there's a huge I mean, there's some studies that use very high doses that didn't show clinical efficacy in terms of symptom scores, medication scores, which is what FDA um, currently requires, like 100, you know, more, more than 48 micrograms a day. And then there's studies that use very low doses that did show efficacy. So to me, the solution studies 
uh, they're not as robust as these very large tablet studies that these two major companies have um, been conducting. And I'm not sure of that either, whether it's an absorption, whether there's more consistent absorption with the tablet. Remember, these are, these are delivered at home, and they're dropper bottles, and they're not, there's concern, even though they're in clinical trials, about how evenly they're actually getting the dose on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, sometimes some of the studies, the earlier studies, they'll start at a buildup one drop twice a day for a couple days, and they go up to two, and then they go up to the next concentration. Though most recently, the newer uh, trials, uh, particularly the tablets, are not using any sort of updosing. They just go to full dose. Mm -hmm. I, I pulled this out because you asked me about grass pollen, so I went looking at that year, and I couldn't really find uh, anything on the uh, National Allergy Bureau. I guess I'm not a registered member, but I found something from Watcham County, Washington State, and it looked like it was a fairly average year, moderate high. So it didn't look like it was a, a bad year for grass pollen, at least not in Washington. Uh, I just wanted to mention these two studies. This is Planet Technology, and they purchased uh, antigen laboratories. And they're doing two phase two studies. They're both registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, to, to uh, let you know. Um, again, I'm trying to get most of my sources from published sites, uh, not inside information, but I did do consulting work for this company a year or two ago. Um, they're looking at two doses for both ragweed and cat. You can see cat is 0.2 versus 2.1, and ragweed is 5 versus 56. They're doing symptom scores, which is what um, they're asked to do as part of the uh, approval process which they would need in phase three. But they're also doing something a little different. They're doing the um, environmental chamber exposure before and after. And there's some thought that maybe this could be a surrogate marker for uh, symptom scores. It might be an easier way to do, if it works, it's effective in, in correlating with symptom scores. It might be easier to do multiple allergen studies if you could just assess response with, uh, with an, a before and after uh, environmental chamber exposure. Um, you have any thoughts on that? In other words, it'd be hard to study three allergens and go through three seasons and hope each one or one perennial in two seasons. But if you could just assess efficacy through a through an environmental chamber exposure, like they do with the CAD studies, it might be a simpler study to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, Day does a lot of those things. He puts pollen into a chamber. He has people record how many sneezes they do. I always thought it would be interesting to observe something like that. Just see people sitting around sneezing in a in a giant chamber. The, the only concern I have about those types of things is it doesn't duplicate the bioaerosol, which may be just as important as the intact mm -hmm. So right now, that's just some preliminary sort of secondary outcome that they're looking at. And then Stallergens, uh, the French company, which is about the probably still the second largest in the, in the country, in the world, uh, behind ALK is doing a, a grass tablet study in the United States. They probably have begun treatment. Uh, yeah, they should have begun treatment, and they're going to go through this grass season and collect data in the fall uh, and have some data in late fall. Uh, so, oh boy, I'm actually ending on time. <laughs> so anyway, in summary of the US clinical trials, none to date have met primary outcome, and the primary outcome being reduction in symptom scores. Issues that have been brought up, patient selection, uh, was it a mild pollen season? Is the other sensitization playing a role? Have been suggested as part of the reasons for these failures. Ongoing studies, Greer should be having data shortly on the phase three ragweed. Uh, Shearing Plow is conducting a phase three grass tablets, so I imagine they'll have data in the fall. Planet Technology should be conducting the ragweed and cat dosing studies uh, this year. I'm not sure when they plan on analyzing and releasing data. And again, Salergens is doing a grass tablet phase three study. Um, just briefly mentioned uh, one of the meetings in Europe uh, that I attended with Rich Gower. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, this was a meeting uh, coordinated by WOW, and they called it the State of the Art Meeting for SLIT. And uh, representatives from all the national allergy societies, as well as other uh, international organizations, and then um, individual countries were invited to attend. Uh, we were, the, the 
uh, national societies were allowed to have up to two representatives, and we were all assigned a section, and we were uh, assigned a section to write for a document that's being put together. Um, uh, so Rich Gower and I uh, went as college representatives, and Hal Nelson and Dennis Ledford went as the academy representatives. And these were the topics that were covered uh, um, during the, uh, the meeting, and it will be in the document. Um, and we all reviewed the uh, bullet points and the unmet needs for each of these sections. And I think, Rich, are you still on the phone? Yes. We came pretty much to consensus. I don't think there was really much debate and rancor. I just want to point out this is uh, to be published. Uh, you should be aware that there are two, two, two cases now of um, anaphylaxis with patients that had previously had systemic reactions to subcutaneous immunotherapy. And they had the reactions on their first dose of grass tablet. Uh, one was a 17-year-old boy who just had allergic rhinitis. Um, and his symptoms after taking the first grass tablet was angioedema around the eyes, generalized urticaria, uh, which responded to antihistamines, and some swelling of the tongue. The other one was a little more severe. She had asthma as well as uh, hay fever. Again, never uh, completed uh, subcutaneous due to systemic reactions. And after her first dose, she developed immediate asthma symptoms, itchiness, faintness, abdominal cramps. And she recognized these symptoms from her skip reactions, uh, treated herself, and then drove herself to the uh, primary care physician's office, nearly fainted, blood pressure was 90 over 50 and she was treated with adrenaline and recovered in the subsequent few hours. I'm told, and we were told at the meeting that in Denmark now, I believe it's in the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, as a result of these two reactions, they're required now to get the first grass tablet in the office. And lastly, uh, as, a, as a college in initiative, uh, we've been asked by we, the Immunotherapy Committee, has been asked to update the split talking points because the Public Relations Committee plans to develop their own talking points for patients and media. And these are some of the questions they want to look at. Who is split for? How does it differ from SCIT? What, what does FDA approval mean? Talking about safety efficacy. The importance of an expert in developing appropriate regimens. Um, and um, why should patients be evaluated by allergists before taking SLIT? And these are points that the PR committee develop, uh, wants to develop directed at patients. These SLIT talking points that are currently available on the website that we will update by March 1st are directed at allergists to answer some of the questions they get from patients and other um, medical non-allergy specialists. And if anybody is thinking about going off-label, um, Don Aronson strongly recommends that they are instructed in informed consent that it is off-label and the rationale for using it off-label. And um, our, the group consensus in the Paris meeting, the WOW meeting, was that there should be specific instructions for the patient, how to manage adverse reactions, what to do about unplanned treatment interruptions, when they should withhold the dose. And a lot of, a lot of this uh, situations really haven't been studied. We really don't know what the uh, recommendations should be. There will be a challenge if this product is approved because somebody's going to have to sit down and try to develop guidelines uh, for instructions for patients based on not a lot of <laughs> not a lot of guidance from the literature. The, these responses in the Netherlands, the SWIT responses, the anaphylaxis, were they related to any season? I mean, is it like um, that? I'm not sure about. It's going to be published in in allergy. I've read both reports, and I don't think it specified what season they were. Um, it was administered. Um, Roy Van Verk. The uh, president of IACI is one of the authors, or he was involved in the case. I don't think he's one of the authors. Yeah, I know. He's aware of, he, he's aware of the cases. Um, I'm blocking on the uh, the lead author. I should have had it. Uh, Groot. Uh, Groot is the lead author, and it's going to be published in Allergy shortly. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. Somehow I think it's not, it was not in season, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Mm. Uh, but one of the reasons I bring that up is uh, in the old area guidelines, uh, when they talked about what would be appropriate for a certain group of patients, uh, patients that have previous systemic reactions to slit, a skit, were listed as one of the potential candidates. 
And at this recent Paris meeting, uh, Jean Bosquet put up a slide, and he had that listed as one of the potential candidates with a big red line <laughs> through it, saying that because of these two case reports, that, that uh, patient population has been pulled out as a potential candidate. Um, anyway, in summary, uh, the status of foot in the United States is still pending. Uh, the proof of concept, I think, has, has been established, but there are still a lot of questions about what the right dose, the dosing frequency, duration, products that we have available in the United States. And uh, they're really, in the collective literature, there's not a consistent relationship between dose and efficacy when you look at the, the whole picture. So I still think each formulation needs to sort of demonstrate what's effective for them. If it's 20 micrograms for a grass tablet, what about Greer's ragweed? Is it 20? Right now they're at 77 micrograms, I think, for the high dose. So they went up from 48 to 77 in their subsequent study. Um, it appears to be safer than skip, but adverse reactions, including anaph you know, severe anaphylaxis, there was one case where there was loss of consciousness, um, and an ICU admission. I didn't present that in this case. Uh, presentation. And we really haven't clearly identified what the risk factors, other than there's this now hint that patients who've had previous systemic reactions may not be appropriate candidates. And anyone who's prescribing it, particularly while it's off-label here in the United States, is really going to have to develop appropriate instructions for the patients, which I imagine would become the chore of the uh, Joint Task Force if it becomes an approved product here. And I think that's the end. Um, Oh, for those of you in other parts of the uh, United States, uh, the pros and cons of living in Florida is we don't have that, but we have a lot of this. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Linda. Um, uh, this has been a really great discussion. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, I, su I fully suspect that when the first product becomes available that we're going to hear a lot about it from our patients and from the media and get all those calls. So developing those talking points in advance and having them available for us is going to be invaluable at some point, I have a feeling. Yeah, I just think we have to be prepared and stay really uh, up on the literature so that we're not uh, taken by surprise um, when it's available um, by being inundated with press and patients and not really have a, a plan on how to prepare ourselves and patients. So we've been speaking with uh, Dr. Linda Cox from, uh, are, are you in Davie, Florida right now? No, I'm in West Palm Beach. Oh, you're uh, in West Palm Beach. And it's freezing cold here. It's freezing um, cold there? Oh, you don't know What's the temperature? <laughs> what's the temperature, Linda? The, probably 58, maybe 55 by now. Oh, it's <laughs> here. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.